Hello, creatives. Welcome to Girl Gang Craft, the podcast. Super excited today because we have Miss Melinda on the podcast today, and I'll let her introduce herself, but she's been in the GGC community in various capacities. Um, She was in Level Up. She was a mentor in Level Up, and she's just been a shining beacon of light in our community and so grateful for her. So welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thanks for being here, everyone. And thanks so much for having me, Phoebe. Thank you for being here. Yay. Tell us um, who you are and what you do. My name is Miss Melinda and I am a professional priestess. I'm a spiritual teacher, a spiritual coach. I provide a variety of teachings and readings as well as professional spellcasting services. And how (laughs) did you get into this? Right. So I always try my best not to make this a super long drawn out story. Um, because basically I started when I was really young, I was about 15. I started, um, seriously practicing around then and also studying around then. But really, um, the story goes back further because I always had a personal, um, natural tendency towards healing and towards psychic abilities, as well as, um, interaction with the invisible world since I was a child. And I think that that's really common for a lot lot of people. And I think a lot of people sort of grow out of it, whether that's through social training or through actively ignoring their gifts and connections. Um, But for me, I didn't, I didn't leave that behind. And as a teenager, I found myself in a position where I was really, um, seeking more education and seeking answers that I wasn't finding in my local community. I lived in a really rural area, um, very conservative rural area. So there weren't people around that could usher me through this. And um, I'll date myself a little. We didn't have internet when I was growing up in this rural community. So um, I started actively studying as a teenager partially to find out um, what was going on with me to make sense of my experiences. And then um, after that, really to learn how to better manage my experiences and how to better use my experiences. So it's been a lifelong path. So you had no sort of magical family around you. This was something that was sort of separate or. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's a really interesting question because one of my grandmothers and one of my great grandmothers had some magical tendencies, but I didn't have a lot of contact with my great grandmother and my grandmother. um, She would not have defined it. She did not define it the way that I define it. Um, And she came from an Amish and Mennonite background. So that very much colored uh, how these things were seen and thought of. Um, Looking back, I can identify that she was definitely a mystic and she was definitely practicing herbalism, herbal magic, um, and a few related things. Definitely had some related beliefs, but defined them much more, much differently than, than I do today. That's so fascinating. So, okay. Back to your youth. Like, how did you, I mean, how did you like process what was happening to you and how did, um, I don't know a little bit more about like the birth of that and like how you decided to sort of take things under your own, your own wing to, to learn more about it. I don't know. That was not very eloquent, but (laughs) I think it was. (laughs) Um, Right. So it's interesting with children, because when you have these experiences as a child, you don't necessarily know that they could be different than what other people are are experiencing. So for a long time, I took that for granted. 
um, just assuming that other people have similar experiences. And it really wasn't until I started getting older and started to articulate some things specifically with my mother um, that I started to recognize, well, she doesn't, she's not having this. She doesn't know what I'm talking about. So um, it's kind of gradually as you develop your verbal skills and as you get older and as you become more socialized, you recognize that other people aren't experiencing the same things. And I think as far as sort of taking the reins and really going further with it, I think that there is a certain amount of necessity in that. Um, I think I'm a naturally very curious person and also an independent person. And I think that that helped, but I also feel that I, I needed to make sense of things. I needed to, to know more, to understand myself better. I really wasn't fitting into my community very well. You know, I needed to kind of get more answers. And can I ask like what kind of experiences that you were having that sort of uh, that sort of triggered this series of events of figuring out what experiences you were having. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a child, I saw spirits quite frequently. Um, they didn't usually speak to me, but I would see them. And I also had a lot of very intense spiritual dreams, um, more like astral travel, more like speaking with spirit guides and speaking with other entities, um, rather than just your normal dreaming. Right. And I mean, now I can distinguish the difference. I don't think then I could, but, um, I also had an awareness of reincarnation, which I believe in. Um, and I had an awareness of some of my past lives as a child. I don't remember them as much now, but I would discuss that with my mother. And I think it took a while before she was like, oh, you really like, this is not just a a children's fantasy. Like you really are telling me you've had these experiences. And I would ask her, don't you remember when we lived that other life and you were that other person? And she was like, no, I do not remember that. (laughs) And I was like, that's weird. I do. (laughs) So these kinds of things. Do you think that as children, we're sort of like more receptive to these spaces? I definitely think as children, we're more receptive to these spaces. I definitely think many of us are born with these tendencies and these, this ability to connect. And a lot of us are just told, oh, you have a very active imagination or you have imaginary friends, um, things of this nature, or we don't talk about that in this house or, you know, whatever the case may be. Mm. So was your, was your family supportive, um, in your journey? It's very interesting. My mother was very supportive in her own way in terms of, you know, not telling me that I wasn't able to talk about these things. She, she allowed me the space to share my experiences and my beliefs and opinions, even as a small child. Um, As I got older, it became more difficult (laughs) for sure. And my, my community, my family, not so, not so accepting as I got older. So when did this sort of like, when did the bridge between you studying this for yourself, um, happen? Like how, how did that translate to helping other people? And then how maybe Mm. did it translate to like being an exchange for finances? Yeah. So the, the biggest thing that I can identify in this sort of natural progression is that I was always helping other people informally. Um, And I think that when you are somebody with a natural tendency towards some sort of healing, 
this is a common occurrence in your life. So people would often come to me for advice, um, for help. And I even was performing psychic readings without realizing I was performing psychic readings, right? Like I would be telling people what's going to happen happen or what they could do to change their situation or make their situation better. And because it came naturally to me, again, I didn't realize that I was doing what exactly I was doing or that I was doing anything maybe that other people weren't. Um, And that's just kind of a lifelong experience. And then at some point, um, I just became more and more studied especially especially in tarot, that was the first area that I became more studied in, in terms of reading for other people. And I started to make it a more formal practice. And then after moving to Austin, I really began to develop. So I feel like when I was ready the community kind of appeared, if that makes sense. I I was working in the service industry and I started to give a lot of readings for my coworkers. And I started to provide a lot of guidance and do a lot of different kinds of sessions with them. And through that whole experience, I realized this is not just, this is a vocation. Like this is what I should be doing with my life. This is not just something that I do on the side, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I think that those, that situation and those relationships were really validating to me. And also it was an experience that showed me that I had grown and that I was ready to step into a larger role. So then what happened? So you're, you're, you're sort of ready to share with this with the world. Like, how did you go? Because I know, you know, a lot of people in our community, whether they're, you know, making products or offering services, uh, you know, in our creative community, community slash witchy community, I think that like beginning murky waters <laughs> are, can be really confusing. And so how did you sort of like start to shape your business? How did those beginning uh, how did that beginning time go? And then also like, when did you know you were ready to quit the service industry? Mm, Right. So I had some advantages in the beginning. One advantage was that I had a friend who I was previously in a coven with, and I had actually helped her to start an online witchy business. So I had some experience with that. Uh, And I was able to use some of that experience to start my own business and to make it more formal. The other advantage that I had really was my local community, especially the people I was working with in the service industry. They were so supportive of me and those relationships that I built were and still are incredibly valuable. And the Austin, where I live, is an incredibly supportive place to be in general. So these are some really great advantages that I had. Um, It was still a long process. There was a lot of, it was a long transition. For a couple of years, I worked seven days a week. I worked um, part-time in different restaurants, as well as part-time for a psychic network. I did a lot of different things to piece together my income so that I had, um, control over my my schedule so that I had the flexibility to grow and build my business. So what does your business look like today? I am so grateful and so happy to be doing um, what I'm doing today. Um, It's mostly online, although the local community and all of the um, relationships I've built over the years are still incredibly important to me and incredibly um, supportive and helpful for my business. But many of my clients um, come from online presence, which, of course, has been incredibly 
helpful during the pandemic. Um, I was really fortunate that I already had all of that structure for my business built. I was already working from home. I was already working virtually, already had a solid online presence before the pandemic hit. So again, very fortunate. Um, I've been in business for six years and I've been um, completely self-employed for, I believe, four years of that time. So, so what kind of things do you offer? <laughs> I offer all kinds of readings. So I offer psychic readings as well as tarot readings. Um, and I offer spiritual coaching and teaching. So one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, for magical mentorship, which is assisting you with learning how to cast spells and practice magic, as well as psychic development and intuitive awareness. And I also provide professional spell casting. In my spell casting, I focus really heavily on heart centered healing. Um, it's very important to me to treat the root cause of a problem rather than to simply attend to symptoms. And many, many times the root cause of a problem is that we need some kind of healing. So that has been a very natural progression. Hmm. Well, okay. So I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about business. And then I think I want to talk about sort of some intuition stuff and maybe helping our audience with some tools to open up their intuition. But I know, um, you have been, uh, relying on the Patreon and I know that that's been a big, uh, stable form of income for you. So I would love for you to talk a little bit more about how that works and how that's been successful for your business. Yes. Um, community relationships and connections are so important to building a business and have been the number one support for me all throughout my business. So the community that I have built through my Patreon, which I call my mystic membership. So my mystic members have been um, incredibly important to me, just as important as the community of co-workers in the service industry when I began my business, right? So this hasn't changed. It's always been all about community and the relationships you build and the connections that you make. Um, Patreon has been a really great way for me to create more consistency in my income, especially in the beginning of my business. Um, and it was a huge, it, it played a huge role in allowing me to ease out of those side jobs and become more fully independent. So like, how did you decide what to offer to your members? And I know that Patreon is big on like levels. So how did you sort of dole that out to your community? Mm -hmm. It was easier for me, perhaps, than it may be in other circumstances. And the reason is because I was already offering what I call group services, group spiritual services. And what they are, are full moon spiritual services. It's a candle lighting. It's basically like casting one large spell for a group of people, but with a spiritual inclination. So I was already offering these services and I was doing it on my own, which meant a lot of extra administrative work. And when I learned that I could streamline some of this admin work through Patreon and have my members, you know, direct my members there for these services, it really um, helped me a lot. It cut out a lot of extra work. Um, and, it, and my clients love it and they loved it right away because they were able to just get everything from me in one place. Whereas before that it entailed, you know, several different moving pieces, one of them being emails, you know, sending, sending reports and things out via email. This is 
this is much more streamlined and it's also a really intimate and safe community where people can easily access me. You can message each other um, and you receive the content from me that nobody else is receiving. It's like a paid Facebook, but better. Love it. Um, you mentioned the word safe. Um, how, what kind of pushback have you had from um, t- about your work as a witch? What sort of um, pushback have you received and how have you handled that? Yeah, there's a lot of pushback in, in, um, it's in a lot of ways, it's very much still a fringe profession, right? Even though we've always had an honored space in society, we've always played a key role in healing our communities and tending to our communities, spiritual and magical needs. Um, we're still part of our culture's shadow material, right? We're still, um, associated with figures that our culture wants to repress. Um, I could go on about that forever, but I won't. Um, I do, for me, it's very personal as well because I receive a lot of pushback from my family and I, I get along with everyone, you know, I, so it's not, it's not crazy, but um, people definitely do not approve of my practices and certainly of me being so out and open about my professional practices. So it can be difficult. Um, One of the big things I think that comes up for a lot of witches and a lot of people in my position is just this feeling of being unseen, you know, um, not seen, not heard, not understood. And that's, I mean, that's something that goes back to mythological archetypes, right? That's part of what the the witch is. And it's part of why it's really important that we do speak out about what we believe and who we are and what we practice. So I think that for me, having a public voice is actually really cathartic. I think that's one of the ways that I deal with it. Um, I also have a tendency to turn things into a growing or a learning lesson, which sometimes serves me well and sometimes does not. (laughs) But um, I do use the uh, relationships with my family as a learning and growing lesson for me in how to communicate with people when we have differences of opinion. and how to show up and stand in my power and be seen, even if um, the other person doesn't want to see me, you know, how to to take up space um, and how to diplomatically communicate, which I think is something that our culture needs very badly at this point. I think we very much need to learn how to talk about our differences or even just admit out loud that we have differences and be okay with that. Right. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. A different side of a similar coin. Mm-hmm. Mm, what advice do you have for people who maybe they're not getting pushback from other people, but they're, they're doubting their selves and they're doubting their abilities and, um, Hmm. I mean, even personal experience, uh, you know, I'm someone who has various magical practices and then some days I'm sitting here, like, you're so silly, (laughs) you know, like (laughs) you're like, this is so silly. Or like, how can you even believe this stuff? Or, you know, like, is magic real? Are we all just, you know, I don't know. So (laughs) as someone who is, you know, struggles with this myself, I don't know, any sort of advice do you have about that? Yeah, I think that having, I think that having doubt is really normal and natural and that we have doubt about all kinds of things in life and about ourselves. So it's not any different that we might sometimes doubt our magic or we might sometimes doubt our beliefs or our spirituality. Mm. And I think it's really healthy sometimes to question yourself and to reevaluate 
as long as you're not doing it in a judgmental way um, to touch in with yourself about what is it that I do believe? How is this showing up in my life? What is the evidence that I see of magic? There are reasons that I believe this. What are those? So questioning can be a really healthy form of therapy for yourself in in working through that kind of doubt. I also think that it's really important to realize that many of us have internalized the pushback from outside of us, even if we're not experiencing it directly. Many of us have internalized that. And most often what I see is that if somebody doesn't have the same beliefs that I do, then they typically just assume that I am a fraud or that I'm scamming people, right? And so I think that that kind of attitude is something that many of us with these beliefs pick up on. Like, is there something wrong with me? Is this, you know, a fantasy? Is, am I, you know, these questions are normal and these are the reasons why, <laughs> right? So thinking about the why is really important. So in what ways can we, uh, access our intuition easier and in what ways can we sort of like, uh, practice, uh, bringing this magic, not just in spell work, but maybe throughout our whole day to day. Yeah. So The first and easiest way to more actively access your intuition or even just to become aware of your intuition is to have a meditation practice. And the reason that a meditation practice helps you is because um, you develop mindfulness and you develop clearer concentration. And these things allow you some space in your mind so that you can actually observe what's happening with you. And our intuition is very much about observing it happening. Most of us already have some strong strong, um, sense of intuition going on within us. It's just that we may not be aware of it because we don't have the space to observe it. And then the second part about more easily accessing our intuition is to begin to recognize what senses speak to you the most clearly or the loudest. Do you have a tendency to be more drawn to sounds or to sight? Do you have a tendency to feel feelings in your body or in your head? Are you more of a visual thinker or more of a feeling thinker? Getting getting to know how your senses work for you is going to give you a stronger sense of how your intuition works. And then you can begin to follow the, the breadcrumbs, begin to follow that trail and get down to exactly how it works for you. And it's mostly about observing that and discovering that and allowing it to happen, allowing yourself to be present with it rather than making it happen. A lot of times people think that developing your intuition means that you have to make it happen or that you have to reach out to something outside of you and like pull it to you. And it's much more about allowing what's already happening within you to be present. Do you have any suggestions for meditations for um, someone who doesn't have a meditation practice? Also, if you don't, people are moving in upstairs. So that that's, that's what we're working with. (laughs) (laughs) If you don't have a meditation practice and you aren't familiar with meditation, then I definitely recommend trying guided meditations first. And then if you, um, if you like guided meditations and you want to go deeper, or if you're somebody who's already familiar with, with some meditation, then I recommend chakra meditations. Um, 
they are really, really helpful and really powerful for opening up your intuition and your spiritual connection. Do you have anyone in mind in particular that you can think of or an app? Or... I have, yeah, I have both of those things. I yeah. have a, a, or you offer them. Um, yeah. On my cool. YouTube channel, as well as in some of my Instagram videos, is I have a bunch of free guided meditations. Um, and then I also use insight timer for guided meditations. There is, it's an app, it's free. There's a million guided meditations and spiritual talks and all kinds of things there that can be found. Um, yeah, Gabby Bernstein is a really popular spiritual teacher who has a lot of great guided meditations on her site as well. Lots of, lots of great places to find free guided meditations. What was the app you said? Insight? Yeah. Insight timer. Cool. Insight timer. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll link a few of those and we'll link your meditations to the podcast episode summary awesome. as well. Um, okay. Um, do you want to talk about spell work a little bit? Sure. I would love to. Um, um what is a spell? <laughs> yeah, broad ranging definitions, right? There's there's a lot of different ways to practice magic. There's a lot of different ways to cast a spell. The in my opinion, the most basic definition is going to be using your using your connection to energy and your willpower to influence energy within you and around you and therefore change things in our everyday lives. Um, so making magic is really about working with energy, influencing energy. The way that I cast spells has a lot to do with what I refer to as spiritual channeling. And this means channeling energy through my chakras and using that energy um, to work with my hands and to, to charge my candles and to then transform the energy and send it back out into the universe. Um, and it sounds maybe complicated or very esoteric, but it's really just about learning that we are natural conduits for energy we are made of energy. Everything around us is made of energy. And again, it's about allowing that energy to flow through us in a conscious way, using our intention and our willpower in relationship to that energy. But um, to, to bring it down a little bit more to the, the physical mundane level, my particular brand of magic is candle magic typically. So I love to work with fire. Fire is a very um, transformative energy. I view it as a spirit of its own. Fire offers us um, a gateway into trans transformation and transmutation, right? So it's really helpful in changing energy. Um, yeah, I think the, that's the basics of, of my spell casting. I'm happy to answer any other specific questions about it, though. Maybe um, any suggestions for someone who's trying to cast their own spell and just uh, just starting? Yes, um, I get these questions a lot. And my number one recommendation for people is not, not to be afraid to experiment. Practicing magic is the kind of thing that you are not going to learn unless you allow yourself to experiment and allow yourself to really practice. I think that there is a lot of fear. Um, maybe again, people absorb this fear or internalize this fear from the outside world sometimes, but I think that there's a lot of fear associated with learning to practice magic. Um, and there's also this idea that you have to be a developed master before you try to cast a spell, but it's really something that has to be learned by doing. You have to have that direct experience in order to understand how magic works for you, because it is going to be a very individual thing. 
the way that energy works in, in Phoebe's body is going to be different than the way it works in mine. And learning those things is essential in, in learning how to practice magic. I would also say it's fine to read the spell books and see what other people are putting together and what other people are recommending and even to try those, but don't ever be afraid to rearrange a spell to make it more suitable for you or to create your own because it's really important that you have a personal connection to the magic that you are creating. So even if somebody who who you think is more experienced than you or more knowledgeable than you tells you that you have to do it one way. If that doesn't feel right to you, you should really try and do what does feel right to you. I feel like there's so many connections here with like an art practice. Um, like even in being in ceramics today, I'm, you know, I'm learning ceramics for the first time or it's, I guess it's a continuation journey, but it's been a long time since like I've done this and, um, just, you know, my teacher saying just, you know, there, there are some, there are some things, but like, try this glaze, see what happens, you know, there's like, and I'm really liking ceramics specifically because as a painter, I, I've sort of like, mm, I hold myself to a certain standard. Okay. And then learning a new skill, there's almost like this ability to be more playful, at least now. I mean, in theory, sure. I could be more playful with my painting, but like, I guess I'm fighting the, the thing that's telling me it has to be a certain way. Right. Right. But so I like this idea of, you know, just getting your hands dirty of just trying something of rearranging things and throwing some things on and, and trusting yourself um, and experimenting. And again, it doesn't have to look like anything. This doesn't have to be an Instagrammable spell. This doesn't have to like right. be anything. It's, it's for you to try and see what works. Yes, definitely. And just like you said, there are some basics to learn, right? Um, especially if, you know, depending on what route you go, if you want to incorporate herbs into your magic, for example, then you want to learn what elements and what energies correspond with those herbs and stick to those pretty much. But it's, it is very much like an art practice, learn the basics and do what works for you. Is there anything like, I know some healers and witches sort of talk about, um, protection and making mm-hmm. sure that like bad energy doesn't come in. Do you have any sort of thing that you want to speak of about that? Right. I like to call it negative or unwanted energy. And um, it is a very interesting topic because many people, especially what could be referred to as new age, which is don't really believe in negative or unwanted energies. Um, from my perspective, all I have to do is kind of look around at the world and I can say, yes, there are some energies that I don't want in my life or, or in my magic. Right. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, protection might become more important to specific individuals and specific practices. It is an important tool to learn that I would recommend that anyone who wants to practice magic or witchcraft or spell casting should begin to learn. But I think that it's more important in some situations rather than others. So for example, If you have natural tendencies towards mediumship, you're going to want to learn some protection magic. If you decide that you would like to communicate with your ancestors who are spirits of the dead, then you are going to want to focus on learning protection magic. So those are some examples of why and how protection might become more important. And why is protection magic more important for working with spirits? Because if spirits are attracted to you, or if you are calling spirits into your presence, um, 
consciously and intentionally, there may be some spirits who show up that you don't want to communicate with. They could even be your ancestors that you've decided you don't want to communicate with. So it's really important that you um, have free will and that you have a method or tools in place to send energies or entities or spirits away if you choose not to interact with them or that you protect yourself from them in the first place. Mm. We want to be, as as witches and magical practitioners, as spiritual people, we want to be as intentional as possible about the energy that we interact with, whether that's in our day-to-day life in terms of, am I going to engage with that toxic person or not? Or if that's in our magical practice, am I going to engage with that toxic spirit or not? Or to put it another way, or to look at it from another perspective, am I going to allow anger or bitterness or revenge or hatred to have a place in my magic, right? So there's a lot of different um, reasons we may want to focus on protection and extra intention around that protection. Thank you. I love your parallels between the magical world and the real world. Cause it's all connected, but I just think you do a great job of, uh, of pointing out, uh, parallels. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I think it's, um, I think it's important to recognize like we're entering into a relationship with energy when we practice magic, right. Or for those of us who may believe in spiritual entities, we're entering into a relationship with the spirit if we choose to engage with them. And it's a lot like a relationship with another person. We have to think about boundaries. We have to think about intentions. We have to think about reciprocity and what we want that relationship to be like. Okay, circling it back to the business witches, what advice do you have for uh, folks with magical practices who are not yet um, not yet on their financial journey with it, or or have sort of started? What what sort of advice do you have for these people who want to make a business out of magic? I think that one of the most important things is not to box yourself in from the beginning. One mistake that I have seen a lot of people make is you come out of the gate with very, very rigid set ideas about what your beliefs are, what your practices are, what your judgments are about others. Um, these, these kinds of things, this kind of rigid ideology. What is going to happen as you progress is that your beliefs, your experiences, and your practices are going to change. View yourself as fluid and ever learning from the beginning so that you do not trap yourself in something. And refrain from judging others because your beliefs are going to change. (laughs) Yes. I think this, uh, I think this, uh, works for all business owners. Um, you know, we think our business is going to be one way or we want it to be a certain way in this time from now. And I think you lose that on opportunities. I mean, the pivots, the pivots that we've all done during, um, this time and being open to what other things that you might be interested in, I think is very important. Definitely. Definitely. The other advice I have for spiritual entrepreneurs, whether they're witch biz peeps or um, spell casters or what, or just spiritual individuals, um, is that you're going to have to commit to an ongoing journey of growth for yourself in order for your business to evolve. If you become stuck in your personal growth, your business is also going to stagnate. The clients that you attract are going to be, are going, you're going to attract 
clients that have something to do with where you're at on your personal journey. And if you want to continue to evolve, then it's helpful to recognize that and to see what your clients are teaching you and to actively take part in the evolution of yourself. You won't be able to separate your personal evolution from your business evolution. You can have boundaries, you can have healthy boundaries and you should, but you won't be able to completely separate those things. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Where yeah. can where can our community find you? You may find me on Instagram at Miss Melinda with three underscores in between Miss and Melinda. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me at Miss Melinda's Metaphysical Services.com and Miss Melinda.com. And we will link all of these goodies and information that you have shared with us with our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it.